Welcome back to another episode of Animal of the Week. Sorry for the rather random schedule and lack of videos other than 7 Days of Science recently, but we have been rather busy with university and family stuff. But now I have finally found the time to do another Animal of the Week. We are bending the rules a bit when it comes to taking a look at just one animal, because today's animals, the sea spiders, are an order of over 1,300 separate species. However, they are all so interesting and strange looking I thought I would group them together. It's also probably far more ethical to just have one video on all of them, rather than milking each species individually, which would get very tiresome after a few. The scientific name of the sea spider order is Pantopoda, meaning all feet, which is quite fitting as these sea spiders, and most real spiders, are mainly feet. They belong to the phylum Arthropoda, so I guess they're sort of related to spiders in a very broad sense. And because they're in the subphylum Chelicerata, they are in fact more closely related to true spiders than they are to other marine arthropods like crustaceans, which is quite something if you think about it because you would expect them to be very close to crustaceans by the looks of them. Now, as I've sort of cheated with this animal by including over 1,300 species, their habitats obviously vary wildly, but I can say they do in fact live in the sea. But they live in every sea and ocean on the planet. Specific species obviously will prefer specific habitats. For example, you get a very large species with legs around 70 centimeters long in the very deep and cold oceans of Antarctica, that being the most common species known as the Southern Ocean Giant Sea Spider. In shallower waters, sea spiders tend to be much smaller, and when I say small, I mean small. Sea spiders can be found in tidal rock pools and can be so small they could probably be thought of as zooplankton, being almost microscopic in size. The species known as Amathea verene are about 1cm in size and dwell in deep sea thermal vents, taking advantage of the bustling ecosystems they support. Diets vary based on species, but to show the sheer diversity, I will compare the tiny little Amathea verena's diet to the enormous South Ocean giant sea spider's diet. Our tiny little thermal vent dwellers obviously cannot eat much, and so use a thin proboscis to feed on microorganisms in the water column, sucking them in. On the other hand, our much bigger friend from Antarctica is able to take on much larger prey. It still uses a proboscis for eating, however instead of swallowing microorganisms whole, they will use these proboscis like a straw to suck on things like jellyfish and sponges, slurping them up in bits rather than swallowing them whole. Various other species will eat anything from hydroids to even sea anemones. Interestingly, some have been observed breaking off tentacles from sea anemones and sticking their proboscis into them to suck on them like a slurpee. But the sea anemones usually survive, so the sea spiders act like a parasite, going between different anemones, taking just enough not to kill them. Strangely enough, because they are mostly legs and do not have room for a digestive system in their abdomens, their guts are located in their legs legs, so that's where the food will end up. Almost all species have two separate genders and are not hermaphrodite, so I will explain their methods of sexual reproduction and ignore the only species that reproduces asexually. Some species go through a sort of courtship ritual, but all use external fertilization between one male and one female. Strangely enough, the sea spiders possess good parental instincts, or actually more like paternal ones, as the females will leave their fertilized eggs for the males to look after. The males have overgers, which store the fertilized eggs once the female has deposited them and left. Once hatch, there are four different organized types of larvae behavior observed over the 1,300 species. Firstly, there are the typical protonymphon larvae. These are the most common and are simply free-floating, free-living larvae that develop into adults. Second is the encysted larvae that are a bit more complicated. When hatched, they will find a polyp colony to parasitize. They burrow into the colony and turn into a cyst and stay there until they become juveniles. Next is the atypical protonymphon larvae. They are also also parasites, but choose other hosts like clams and polychaetes. They will also stay in the host longer as they wait to be adults before leaving, so they spend their juvenile stage also being parasites. Finally are the attaching larvae that when hatched attach themselves to the legs of their fathers until they are juveniles. Sea spiders possess a very unique way of breathing that no other known animal on the planet possesses. They breathe using gut peristalsis. This is where the contracting of their digestive system forces the circulation of oxygen around their bodies. They do not have lungs or even gills, and so they absorb oxygen directly from the water through their exoskeletons. As they are mainly legs, they absorb it primarily through them. But to get the oxygen flowing around the rest of their body, they contract their guts, which as you will remember, are also in their legs, forcing the oxygen circulation 
population is truly a remarkable feat of evolution. Another adaptation is the size of the South Ocean giant sea spiders. You may be wondering why this species gets so big compared to most others, and it's actually an adaptation to survive the cold. Their size gives them a smaller surface area to volume ratio and therefore allows them to conserve heat better and survive. The vast number of species means I cannot give an accurate description of their conservation status, but I'm sure there are some species doing very well and others poorly. Natural predators of the sea spiders can vary wildly based on species, but smaller species may be preyed upon by fish and any number of different crustaceans. Larger ones are probably harder to kill, but will still be vulnerable to larger organisms. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel, we think we deserve it, and if you'd like to see more from us.